It was the joke name for a boat that amused us all. But whatever happened to Boaty McBoatface? Well, the answer is in Antarctica, of all places, as part of a vital research project. And we've sent our intrepid science correspondent, Martin Stew, to find out all about it. So what is Boaty's mission and, and why does what's happening out there matter for us here in the UK? I'm Lucy Watson and this is What You Need To Know. Hello, Martin. Hello, Antarctica. Although it does look like you're just in the office behind me, to be perfectly honest. But I, I, I do know that it is, in fact, you are in Antarctica. And you and your cameraman, Mike, who I know very well too, you've surely got the assignment of the week, the decade. I mean, I just, I can't quite get over how amazing it is where you are. Every journalist dreams of like getting the first interview with whoever, being somewhere first, but you are quite legitimately the first British journalist to ever go this far south in the Antarctica, in the polar winter. I mean, that explain that to me in itself. Why is it so amazing that you're that far south? I mean, it's completely bonkers. Sorry about the backdrop. The backdrop, as you said, the reason uh, we're in this building is because it's pitch black outside because it is the polar winter. It's also, would you believe, quite cold because it's Antarctica. <laughs> um, uh, when I got the text from the British Antarctic Survey to say we might have a couple of spaces on the RRS, the David Attenborough, or Boat or Boatface, as you may well know it, uh, obviously the answer was yes, please, can we go? And it's a really unusual trip because trips to Antarctica are becoming more common. We're seeing more tourists going down there. You can actually fly onto the landing strip, but only in the summer months because then it's lighter, it's less cold, and there's less ice. Going down at this time of year has has more risks, but also potentially more rewards. So we've been given the option to come down sailing through ice fields, and it's been just the most amazing journey. I mean, I would say it turns out Antarctica is quite a long way away. So we <laughs> uh, we flew initially down to the southern tip of Chile. There's a place called Punta Arenas, which has been the setting off place for Antarctic explorers for you know, decades, but more than a century, in fact. It actually was there. If you know the story of Ernest Shackleton, he was the uh, Antarctic adventurer who got his ship, Endurance, stuck in the ice. And it was in Punta Arenas where he managed this incredible mission where he went across... Uh, the sea in a in a lifeboat, got back over to Chile, and then he had to arrange to find a captain to come and rescue his men who'd been stuck on the ice for more than a year, living off seal meat, basically. And it was there that he went. Anyway, I'm no Shackleton. Let's let's make that clear. Yet, yet. But yet. But when you're in Punta Arenas, you get this real sense of adventure. There's a statue of Miguel and the, uh, the, the famous explorer, and everybody who's going to Antarctica rubs his big toe, and it's actually sort of shiny now where everyone's rubbed it so many times. But most of those people do it in the summer months. And the fact that we're going in the winter is kind of unusual. It's cool, but it's also quite worrying because the fact that we're able to make this journey tells us something about the way uh, the climate is changing. So you've talked to me about the journey. Well, you, you started, you flew well, to Chile. I know you flew journey, to yeah. Chile, but I also know that there's you had to cross the Drake Passage, which is... Notoriously choppy, shall we say? How was the tummy? Well, I mean, let's just start this by saying that I'm known as the travelling egg because I'm such a fragile traveller. I can be stuck <laughs> on any form of transport. I've never that heard that so I was, before. No, I, well, maybe I coined it, but I, I was nervous, to say the least. Um, the Drake Passage is the bit that goes from the south of South America down to Antarctica, um, and it's got the fastest moving currents in the world. It's where the Atlantic and the Pacific meet. And that can give these huge waves up to 12 metres tall. So I've done all the prep. I've got some special seasickness patches you put behind your ear. Actually, we were incredibly lucky. The sea state was relatively calm. It was still rolling around. I still had to have a few little moments where I lay in my bunk and had a quiet word with myself. But actually, I wasn't sick, which was incredible. It was still rough. Just talking to you, Martin, I am genuinely getting kind of goosebumps, shivers, because I, it's just so incredible, this adventure that you're that you're on for us and, you know, for listeners and on our audience, um, telling them what you're experiencing. What have you seen so far? I mean, just the most amazing sights. So as you were kind of across the Drake's Passage, then all of a sudden you feel the temperature starts to drop and you know you're getting closer. And obviously it's, it's 
winter, so it's dark a lot of the time. And we could go up to the bridge where the captain's stationed. And as you go up the stairs, it's really atmospheric. It's got red lights on. And you go up, it's like you're sort of stepping into some Star Trek movie. And then you get to, to look at the view out the front. And it looks exactly like another world. They've got these huge spotlights, which are so powerful, sweeping across the ocean, which is covered in ice. And the whole time, these searchlights have to sweep because they're looking out not for sea ice, which is where the salt water freezes. That's fine. The boat's designed, or the ship rather, is designed to raise up and just crash through that. That's not a problem. But it's the big bits of freshwater ice that has fallen off ice sheets or glaciers because that can be kind of hard as concrete. Things like icebergs or they call it bergy bits is the next one down and then growl as smaller still. And they might not look that big, but obviously 90% of an iceberg or a bergy bit is below the water. And they can come from any direction. So at all times, you've got a couple of people up there keeping a close eye on everything. They've got a, an ice radar that's like a radar, but it can also see in 3D. So you can see which the really deep icebergs are and the ones you need to avoid. And then they slow down and they're steering through this ice field. And it is like you're in another world. It's completely silent, completely calm. And you're in this red light bathed area just looking out. It's absolutely magical. And then... I go to bed because I'm lazy and I'm not of any use to these things. <laughs> they stay on watch, get into the cabin, and you're lying there. And every now and then you hear this like, Dwang! which is, you know, the ship is designed to hit ice. It is an ice breaking ship. Um, it's got an inch thick steel hull. But you hear this ice crunching against the hull just next to your head. You're thinking, oh my goodness, what is going on? Um, but we got through. And then the next morning, as the sun came up, we we're in this famous channel called Le Maire and you've got mountains on either side icebergs in the middle and it was like being in Narnia we saw uh, someone on board counted a hundred humpback whales as we were going <sighs> along they were coming out through water spouting you know the kind of tail giving you a wave all that sort of stuff penguins diving across the water seals just chilling out on top of the icebergs um it's just absolutely magical. And this sort of ethereal light, because the sun doesn't rise above the horizon, doesn't get above the mountains, but because everything's white, it kind of bends and refracts around. And so you get these lovely different shades of shades of sort of pinky greens and blues and everything you can imagine. It's been absolutely breathtaking to see. Now, um, the scientists that you're kind of rubbing shoulders with and chatting to day in, day out, no doubt, I mean, they're diving in these sub-zero temperatures. Incidentally, how cold is it? It's not as cold as fear, which perhaps plays into the climate change story. I mean, it's probably been about minus two, minus three most days. Oh. Adding the wind chill, it feels like minus 10. But you, we've got loads of kits. The British Antarctic Survey, very professional. They've kitted us out with everything that we possibly need. So it's not been that I'm cold. Jealous of the, I'm jealous of the turn. zipper you've got on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but, but a bit of branded merch. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I think the weather, the weather will turn. I mean, normally it's about minus 10 at at this time of year. If you were to go all the way to the South Pole, it's about minus 30 at this time of year, which is obviously significantly colder. Um, so, yeah, it's cold, but it's it's not that cold. And, and the scientists on board, it's, it's been really interesting to spend the journey with them and just sort of pick their brains about what they're seeing and what they want to study. Because part of it is it's so difficult to do science down here because it's so remote, it's so challenging, that getting as much data as people want to get as good as science as possible is really challenging and yeah you know, we always know that there's lots of people who question the validity of climate change science and what the scientists want to do is make sure that they are presenting the most fact-based you know evidence and rationale and reasoning for what they are seeing happening and so that's why a journey down at this time of year is, is partly so interesting because normally most of the research and the data is collected in those summer months when it's easier to so getting an understanding of what's happening in the winter gives a much more sort of 365 days a year picture and people can understand it better. So I think it's called opportunistic science or something like that. Is that, are they actually, I mean, I know you're excited and Mike is excited to be there, but are they quite excited because this is not normal for them to be there that far south too? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, so two of the scientists on board, there's uh, Professor Mike Meredith, who's sort of big name in oceanography and climate science. And then Dr. Rhiannon Jones, she's worked in his team. And six years ago, they were down here in the summer months and they were on the bridge of the Sir David Attenborough, looking at the front of a glacier. And it carved, which is when it, the ice kind of crumbles and collapses and falls into the sea. 
but this was a big carving. They looked at a satellite data afterwards, and they and somewhere between three and 20 million tons of ice fell into the ocean in front of their eyes. And at that time, it made them think, oh my goodness, you could see the waves rippling on the surface, but they went wondered, I wonder what's happening underneath. And what their theory is, is that you get these underwater tidal waves almost that stir up the ocean. And what they want to do is look into that because it makes a big difference. When you stir the ocean up, you can release more heat and more carbon to the atmosphere. You can also stir up nutrients, which may change what's able to live and grow in the ocean. But what was amazing this time is, again, they were stood on the bridge in exactly the same spot, but in the winter. And would you believe the glacier carved again in front of their eyes? It was a much smaller event, probably thousands of tons of ice rather than millions of tons of ice. But still, it's enormous. It's huge. And they didn't expect this sort of thing to happen in the winter. You would expect it to happen in the summer when the ice is melting and things are more in, unstable. So the fact it happened during the winter and it happened in front of their eyes it, it's like it's science happening right there live and i mean this is why we need to take notes and um, and heed the warnings in effect just explain to me mm. quite simply i mean i suppose that anecdote there about the scientists and what they've witnessed kind of does it but why is what's happening before your eyes so so far away from us so relevant to us and the rest of the world yeah, I mean, for several reasons. The first thing you would remember is Antarctica is huge. As I said, it's nearly twice the size of Europe, twice the size of Australia. It is massive, and it holds the vast majority of fresh water in ice on the planet. So if things change there and it melts and it goes into the ocean, it makes a big change. And all things are connected. So the way that our currents move around the world, you know, we have the Gulf Stream that keeps the UK sort of artificially warm because it brings warm water up from the Caribbean. If you start messing with the temperatures and the, what's going on in different parts of the ocean, those currents potentially can change. So it can have a massive impact. And one of the things we've noticed is the change in sea ice. So sea ice is where the sea itself melts. Now, it melts, sorry, it freezing and then melting again doesn't alter sea levels because it's just the sea freezing or not. But it is happening at a huge scale. So if you compare to 30 years ago at this time of year, there is 1.5 million square kilometers less of sea ice at the moment than there was 30 years ago. That is six times the size of the UK. It is enormous. And that matters because, first of all, the sea ice is white. And so it reflects more heat away. It bounces it away. It's a bit like if you stand on a hot black pavement, you get warmer than if you're stood uh, you know, on some grass or something that's a lighter color. It's called the albedo effect. So when you lose the white, the ice around Antarctica, that helps heat up the planet. The other thing is that it protects the ocean from the wind, and the wind mixes up the ocean, as I was talking about earlier, stirring up that colder, denser water from below, releasing heat and carbon into the atmosphere. So losing sea ice isn't a good thing. That then, in turn, can have an impact on the glaciers and the ice sheets, meaning that they are carving more rapidly into the sea. And when that ice that's on land ends up in the ocean, that is when we start to see ocean levels rise. And all these things are interconnected. And a recent survey found that it always was assumed that the Arctic in the north was warming much faster, but Antarctica was quite stable because it is such an enormous area of frozen ice. But what they're seeing now is that it, things are accelerating. Where we are, the peninsula, which is the finger that points up towards Chile, is the fastest warming bit. And it's kind of the canary in the coal mine. It's the sort of bellwether for what may happen in other places. And what people think now is that by the end of this century, so within our children's lifetime, Lucy, we are going to probably be seeing sea level rises going up about a centimetre per year. And you might think, well, that's not very much. A centimetre is nothing. But at that stage, it starts to get very hard to adapt, build sea defences, change, make us more resilient to storms and hurricanes and all these sorts of things. And that is happening in our children's lifetime. And that is if, and it is a big if, we keep climate change to 1.5 degrees. At the moment, we are on track if we don't rapidly change things for more like 2.9 degrees. I know you're of science correspondent and you live and breathe this stuff, uh, Martin, but does it make it 
all the more grave when you're seeing it for yourself and and you want to like hurry change along somehow. Yeah, I think so. What I was very struck by though is that the scientists uh, have a kind of message of hope as well. That you know, thing the planet is not in a good state. We need to change. Things need to be done. Uh, those things we know the political discussions around that they they are difficult. They can be expensive. They are uncomfortable to make those changes. But the scientists also say, you know, change can, if done quickly, help us mitigate this. You know, we're, we're not going to stop a lot of the sea level rise. We're going to see it's baked in. It's going to happen. But we can stop it getting to catastrophic levels. And the one thing I was struck by coming down here as well is 40 years ago this summer uh, was when British Antarctic scientists discovered the hole in the ozone layer. And after discovering that, we had, you may remember, the ban on CFCs that were in deodorant cans and various other aerosols. And, and since then, we are now starting to see the hole in the ozone layer very slowly, but it is starting to close back up. And in 50 years ago, 50 years time, hopefully, it should be back to where it was. If nothing had happened, the forecasts were that the hole in the ozone layer, which was over Antarctica, would have spread around the whole globe. And that was human action that we took that made a fundamental change. So there is this message that we can do something. It's not hopeless. You know, all is not lost, but we do need to listen to the science. That seems an appropriate point to, to, to close our first chat on your trip. But I could talk to you all day, uh, Martin. I'm sure you've got work to do, though, and, and views to look at. Um, enjoy the next few days, weeks, and hopefully I will chat to you. Well, I know, in fact, that I'm going to chat to you again, and I'm looking forward to it already. We will be back with Martin in a few days' time, hopefully. So safe uh, reporting to him and to Mike. And you can listen or watch to all our quick news briefings by subscribing to What You Need to Know on YouTube, Spotify and any podcast platform. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>